Well, welcome to The Emergent Human, where we explore optimizing health, embodied spirituality, and post-conventional living. I'm Michael Osterlink, a therapist, coach, and educator, and I'm your host. Another shout out to Dr. Stuart Tavatsky, scholar of Kundalini Yoga. I'm working with Stuart on an online class to be launched soon on his book, Advanced Spiritual Intimacy, The Yoga of Deep Tantric Sensuality. Today's show is brought to you by Kostra Scafidi, an amazing body worker in the Northern Virginia area who's integrated various somatic practices into his work, including rolfing. You can learn more about his work at kosperscafidi.com. Today's guest is Dr. Jenny Wade. Jenny Wade, professor with the Integral and Transpersonal Psychology Doctoral Programs at the California Institute for Integral Studies in San Francisco, is a developmental psychologist, researcher, and consultant who specializes in the structuring of consciousness and the spontaneous openings and intentional practices that expand human potential by accessing innate capacities. Dr. Wade's research of variations in normal adult consciousness forms the basis of a leadership and organization development consultancy of more than 20 years. The developer of numerous proprietary research products for global and Fortune 500 companies, she is a founding board member of a new laboratory middle school whose program is based on her developmental model and recently developed a transformational school for leaders for the International Peace Foundation and a private foundation headed by Prince Alfred of Liechtenstein. She is a frequent media presenter and author of Changes the Mind, a Holonic Theory of the Evolution of Consciousness, and Transcendent Sex, When Lovemaking Opens a Veil, and many academic articles. Hi, Jenny. Good to see you. Uh, hi, it's great to be with you, too. I appreciate you coming on the podcast. So we are going to talk about your book, Transcendent Sex, as well as some of the other cool projects you got going on. But before we do, you know, studying consciousness per se and then your kind of lanes that you study consciousness is not your normal um lane that most people get into <laughs> how did you get into the study of consciousness generally speaking transcendent sex particularly and then some of those other areas that you also are very fluent in and knowledgeable about um well i came into it actually when i had a very conventional sort of business career in market communications. Um, I worked for a number of very large corporations and I became intrigued with the way people in different parts of those organizations had difficulty communicating with each other. Even though we all wanted the same goals, the marketing people might as well have been speaking a different language from the engineers who might as well have been speaking a different language from the manufacturing people. And I kept wondering, you know, why is it that these folks can't talk to each other and understand each other? And about that time, I happened on the work of uh, the late Claire Graves uh, in human development, talking about different levels of development and how those different levels have different values and therefore emphasize different things when they're talking to people. And I really became intrigued by that and began doing a deep dive on it and realized that it wasn't just difference in values. This, this put me into looking at all the developmental theories, many of which are about ego development, morals development, reasoning, you know, cognitive development. And I sort of fell in love serially with each one of the authors that I was reading but ultimately fell out of love with all of them and thought, you know, th this is just all over the place. Why can't we bring this stuff together? And I kept thinking about what would it take? What actually encompasses all of this different research? And the answer to me was, oh, it's about awareness. It's about what people are paying attention to in their environment. How do they direct their intention and how much of the available environment do they perceive? Um, do they only perceive certain kinds of interactions and not others, certain events, certain entities, not others? And that was the way I began to put it together. So I actually, the, my first book was a synthesis and distillation of developmental theories to look at the structuring of consciousness. And um, so it's all about 
how people perceive their world and then are able to interact with it. And that involves really the fundamentals of the structuring of consciousness, which are time, space, and agency. And so that's how I began to get into that. Now, I do recall probably in the very early 2000s, I got certified in your, in your system. Yes. Uh, and I'm wondering, do you still offer that as a training for folks? Um, I have it for some time just because my interests have gone elsewhere. But yes, it is still available. Very cool. Uh, just for since I brought it up, can you just share a 30 second commercial about what it is and why people should actually look into it? Um, yes, um, I teach uh, for most people the range of consciousness that they're most likely to encounter on a day to day basis. Uh, there are probably four main types of consciousness that most people are acting out of. Um, it only goes up to about six that you're likely to encounter in uh, functional adults in any society. There are a couple of higher stages that are very rare to encounter and one uh, lower one that you almost never encounter um, outside of institutionalized uh, settings. But um, because I had a business background, I began using this as the foundation of leadership consulting and organization design because the problems most people have in the workplace as well as other relationships are in not knowing how to translate from the level of consciousness that is normal for them into the ones that are normal for the people around them. And it's the same source of tension I was seeing with engineers and manufacturing people and so forth. And so I teach this to leaders in organizations so that they can communicate much more effectively with customers, vendors, employees, um, or other people that they need to influence to get them on the same page, you know, where, where they're going. It just takes a lot of the friction out of relationships. Yeah. Uh, had I been more interested in counseling, I could have done that as a, uh, as a uh, psychotherapist with couples relationships or family relationships or something like that. But my natural niche was in the workplace. And from the workplace, um, it has expanded into some educational programs or development programs, like the one that Prince Alfred of Liechtenstein was putting together for advanced leadership to try to work with people who are really trying to change the way the world operates and advance more of an agenda for peace. Actually, that, that's a great, so before we get into talking about transcendent sex, since you brought up, and I actually mentioned it earlier, your, your project with the Prince, and then also I mentioned in your bio, an educational program based on your model. Would you mind just touching upon both of those? Um, yes, uh, the um, educational program um, is one that has been now put into a, a middle school. I was one of the founding board members for an experimental middle school because children naturally attain what most people I'll use Maslow's language because most people are familiar with Maslow's model. Most children actually access the level of self-actualization, which is very rarely found in, in a lot of adults, but children go through that stage pretty early in life, beginning at about age eight and naturally being in it from age eight to 11. And so we were trying to create a school that would help children hold on to that level of awareness um, through the middle school years when they are beginning to transition out of being influenced by their nuclear family and being super influenced by peers and a time when their identity is changing. So their sense of themselves is changing now that they're becoming uh, sexual beings as they're hitting puberty and having all these other changes. So if you can get kids to hang on to a piece of that stage, even though they're being buffeted by hormones and other forces that are going to uh, put an emphasis on some of the earlier stages again, if they can hold on to that, then there's a greater likelihood that they'll be able to retain that on into adulthood. And 
self-actualization not only means that the person contributes much more to society, it also means that that person has a much happier, more fulfilled life that draws on their complete complement of talents to offer to the world and to develop in themselves. It's amazing to think that a, a child, 8, 12, 11, 12, 13, depending on when puberty starts, is has potential and is actually actualizing the way Maslow talked about it that you're describing. And then the thing about the forces, cultural, pure, familiar forces, which I guess dampen that. They dampen it severely. So we're just trying to give them enough to hold on to, to bring it forward. And as I'm sure you know, um, with uh, the onset of puberty and sexuality, especially in today's world, there's much more recognition of how many questions of self-identity that bring, brings up for people. Um, what kind of partners they're attracted to, uh, how they identify their genderedness, how they identify their sexuality, those are two different things and how they want to express that. Um, so it's a time of huge questioning and a lot of pressures. And if people can find out what is authentically themselves, and I call it the authentic stage, not the self-actualizing stage, what is authentically true for them, they can resist some of these terrible dampening forces, as you said, that create a lot of suicide in the junior high and high school years where people are so discouraged that they don't fit the norms. But if they can hold on to this kind of consciousness, they can believe in the beauty of who they are with that and, and still be socialized beings, not be destructive people. They can hold on to that socialized but authentic self rather than giving in to despair and feeling like they don't fit in and having to use drugs or alcohol or even suicide to try to cope with those extremely strong pressures at that age. Yeah, I, I could imagine some people listening to this saying, how can an eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 year old have that capacity inside of them? But I'm reminded that the extended adolescence we see today, you know, like into early twenties for some males into the thirties, like if you go back to 100, 200, 300 years ago, like some of the some of the famous people in our history were doing what they did historically at age 12 13 right. 14 15 like yeah. you know, it's only recently that we've like we've made them into a perpetual adolescence okay. i would seem yeah a and your project with the prince just briefly on that one too um yes um he is uh he founded the uh uh, World Peace Foundation and all the living Nobel laureates are members of that. And he was wanting to put together uh, an advanced leadership program to help uh, promote a peace agenda. And he realized that you know most of the leadership training that people get, if they get any at all, most, most leaders and organizations have no training. They just got promoted up the chain, but they never took uh, management or leadership courses and they may know how to manage well. They don't necessarily know how to lead. And all you have to do is look around at government leadership these days in any country to see that, never mind corporate yep. leadership. And so he wanted to advance a more ecologically sustainable uh, vision of leadership and one that had more of a peaceful agenda and recognizing that people didn't have this kind of training, he wanted to put together a curriculum that promoted that and promoted what I think of as really uh, higher human values. And so this leadership program uh, incorporates the developmental model that I was just talking about, as well as um, other capacities that most people don't know. A lot of it is peace building capacity. Uh, there are a lot of peace building courses, uh, sort of much more than regular conflict management. It goes beyond that to, in, to uh, peaceful communication, but also recognizing and honoring um, alternative ways of knowing, such as uh, developing in, intuitive ways of knowing, working with dreams, working with gut feelings, 
and just learning how to discern more uh, the subtle nuances of what's going on in a particular situation. So it was a program that has all of those kinds of things built in, including um, some of the things that I know you're into, Michael, um, uh, if not the actual martial arts practice, practices that develop perception of energy and uh, ways to modulate and use energy effectively around other people, uh, almost what I would call energy etiquette. Um, I love that. A lot of people yeah. have no idea what yeah. they're doing with their energy yeah. in this situation. Wow, I, I love to hear that someone of uh, some high caliber, a prince, and I'm sure he surrounds himself with a lot of very interesting people, it, it has, we might call a second tier approach, if you want to kind of use the Wilburian language or or fifth plateau, if you want to use Mark Divine from Seal Fitz language, people have kind of a higher ordered approach, looking at the whole human being as a system embedded in multiple systems. So that's really good to hear, considering I agree with you when I look at a present day leadership, <laughs> quite disturbing. <laughs> so, good on you. Um, now, with all that, <laughs> you go from the corporate, let's talk about sex. <laughs> yeah, how do you go from the corporate boardroom to the to the bedroom? <laughs> <laughs> well, that started because I had a very unusual sexual experience. Um, you know, I. I've had a, a good sex life, uh, no doubt about that. Um, but one day something happened that absolutely blew me out of the water. I was making love with uh, someone sort of as usual. And the room that I was in, which was just a, a, an ordinary room, looked like a plain white box with windows, suddenly disappeared and I seemed to be in a completely different environment. At first, I thought I was walking on the beach. I saw waves coming toward me and bright sunlight glittering on the waves. And then I seemed to be sucked down into the water and looking at different sea creatures around me. And the sea creatures turned from naturalistic ones into highly stylized ones that reminded me of the Cretan wall paintings at the Palace of Knossos. And I began to see, then I, I was taken out of this underwater environment and I appeared to be in a round room uh, whose walls were painted pink and had a frieze up at the top of the Greek key design, which is you know sort of interlocking squares that then became spirals. And I, all these thoughts were going through and my, my awareness could pull out of it enough to say, am I hallucinating? You know, what is this? I don't know. It seemed real. It didn't seem like it was super, uh, superimposed on the room where I actually was. And I was trying to make sense out of the imagery. You know, were the waves things? Did they have to do with orgasm? Um, energetic waves in my body, I couldn't figure it out. And uh, then just as suddenly as it came, it vanished. And it was such an odd thing. I didn't say anything about it to my partner. I just was sort of troubled by it. Um, although it was a very blissful experience. So a few weeks or months went by. And then I had a full-blown non-dual experience, a full-blown Sartori experience where the room didn't just vanish, everything vanished. There was nothing but white light and then the room reappeared, but my relationship to everything in it had completely changed. So this was what's commonly called as enlightenment, um, where I was, uh, nothing, none of the categories of conditioned experience existed. I was having a pure experience or identification with everything that was there. And it was so unexpected and so total that I started laughing and I, could, I couldn't stop laughing because it was so wonderful. It was so absurd. 
Um, my background was Episcopalian and I was laughing because I knew this was a Buddhist experience. And anyway, I, uh, I just couldn't stop laughing. Well, this brought the lovemaking sort of to a halt because my, my partner didn't know what was going on with me. And uh, so at that point I told him, and then I also told him about this previous experience. And at that point he told me that he also had been having altered states with me and he'd never had them with any other partner and he hadn't told me either. So we got into a discussion about it and I became so intrigued that I started trying to do a literature search on this and found that although many other writers, including Maslow, for example, had alluded to states like this happening during sex, but nobody had actually described them. So that put me on a path for a research study. And I began interviewing people who said that they had had unusual experiences during sex. And it's important to know too that this is uh, psych sacred medicine, psychedelic free. This is non-tantric practicing individuals, including yourself. That's right. Um, I was interested in people like me and my lover for whom this had happened involuntarily and spontaneously when they were not engaging in a practice uh, like Tantra or Taoist sex designed to bring about an altered state during sex and when they were not using any kind of psychotropic substance because I didn't know to what extent those uh, artifactually would condition the kind of states they were in and certainly in Tantra and Taoist sex, it also gives you a way to, uh, gives you goals that you're trying to attain certain states and those states have meaning. So there's a lot of interpretation that gets put on them. And from the allusions that I could find in the literature, it appeared that this was just a, an innate capability that all human beings have without drugs or without special practice. So that's, I was trying to find what is the raw experience that people can have? What is that like? And what I found is it's not like any one particular thing. It's a whole range of altered states that can occur during sex. Can you talk about a, a f both a few of the different states that you've, you've in your research show that can be manifested during the, these experiences? And can you also talk about the, the people that you interviewed? You know, was there age and sexual orientation and other categories you might have explored? Sure. Um, well, I was not trying to get a, a representative sample at first. I was just trying to find people who'd had these experiences. And um, because I lecture frequently at universities and at other venues, um, I would just announce at the end of a talk that I was doing, a re doing some research on sex. And if anybody had had an unusual mystical or altered state experience during sex, and I didn't say what that might be, uh, with a partner when they weren't using drugs or doing some of these practices, I'd like to talk to them. And so people just would, would volunteer. And they were all kinds of people. Um, I think the youngest I had was 21, uh, which, uh, which I needed for age of consent, up to people in their 70s. Uh, men and women, people of uh, different sexual orientations, people who engaged in conventional sex, whatever that is, and kinky sex, whatever that is. I, I was open to anything and, and anybody. Um, and people with all kinds of uh, religious beliefs, which I thought might have affected, especially if they were meditators, might have affected the kinds of states that they had. Uh, different levels of education, all kinds of professions. Uh, it didn't matter. I was just looking for anyone who'd had these kinds of experience. And sure enough, I found out that these experiences happen regardless of your sexual orientation. There was no correlation with choice of partner or uh, identity. Uh, homosexuals have the same kinds of experiences as bisexuals or heterosexuals. Um, People engaging in any kind of sex can have it. It's not related to the mechanics of sex. It's um, only minimally related to orgasm. Um, 
some people thought that, oh, well, you know, some women who can chain orgasms, you know, and remain really energetically and orgasmically up there and very high for an extended period of time might have more than others, but that's not the case. Um, you don't have to have an orgasm at all. Uh, the only correlation with orgasm was that with many men, because of the male orgasmic curve, once they had the orgasm, then they had this big drop off, which oftentimes meant that the state was over. But, and so some people said, I don't wanna have an orgasm when I'm having this kind of sex because this transcendent experience during sex, because it's so much bigger and better. Uh, I don't want that stupid little spasm. It just spoils things. <laughs> Which of course is not most people's uh, yeah. way of thinking about orgasm. But that was, that was true for this sample. So you don't have to be orgasmic to have it. And in fact, for some people, the altered state came on before they even began engaging in, uh, I don't know how you call it, serious sexual activity. Some people just holding hands. Some people just over dinner began to fall into this state. And although they may eventually have wound up in the bedroom, this, they, the state started before they got to that point. Wow. You mentioned you're born in, in the Presbyterian faith. Your experience was Buddhist. And I'm curious, like when you interviewed these folks, did people have their religion? Uh, uh, was any of their transcendent experiences similar to yours where it was not within their framework of their religious belief system? Yes, actually most of them were not. And that was one of the things that made these experiences so confusing for some people. Um, not only were they not engaging in a practice that they thought would bring about an unusual sexual experience, uh, because that was a, they were all taken by surprise, just as I was, you know, like, hey, what the heck's happening here? Um, so they were taken by surprise and that because the experience didn't fit any expectation they had for sex, but also any that they didn't have for religion, they were often really completely confused. Um, people would have classic ta tantric experiences who didn't know anything about tantra. They'd begin to feel you know, electricity buzzing through their body and uh, they might go into spontaneous movements or speaking in tongues. And if they didn't come from a tradition that involves speaking in tongues, um, you know, that would really throw them, you know, or this, you know, what's, what's, happening, what's happening with my body? And, you know, Jewish people would have an experience of something that they thought was the Holy Ghost. It's like, huh, where, where is this coming from? And uh, so it was um, very disorienting for people and sent a lot of people on a spiritual quest because many of them got religious imagery or, or imagery they uh, interpreted as religious. Some people saw angelic or demonic figures. Uh, people saw uh, God-like figures that they didn't recognize. One woman saw the rainbow serpent, which she knew nothing about. Um, and, you know, but they described these very vividly. And for many of them, they, then they started trying to read and do research and find out what was this that I saw? What was this that I experienced? So a lot of people wound up actually changing religions or becoming religious or spiritual where they had not been before as a, uh, directly as a result of these sexual experiences. What do you make of the fact that anyone can have this experience, that they can have experiences that transcends their particular culture and religious belief. What, what, what's that tell you about the nature of consciousness, the nature of reality, the nature of the physical body? You know, do you have any conclusions or at least semi-conclusions from this? Um, well, I just, I think that as human beings, we all have enormous capacities that most of us barely are aware of, much less know how to tap. And I, but I do believe that different cultures have identified ways to tap a lot of these different capacities, whether that's meditation or trance dancing or the, the use of psychedelics even, you know, changing, let's change your brain chemistry and, and see what comes up. So I think that 
the human body has a lot of these capacities. What is interesting to me um, is that it's almost like, um, I guess, a, like the London subway maps. Um, you may have people who are starting from a lot of the outer tube stations, but you know there are only a certain number of destinations in central London and all these places go there. And I think that's what happens with us. The more I've studied um, different states of consciousness and what brings them about, it seems like no matter what the practices are, there are only a limited number of destinations and that humans are wired for particular types of destinations. So that whether you're practicing Tantra or you have an experience uh, through just ordinary sex, um, you will still have the same kinds of energetic sensations. Um, there are certain types of non-dual experiences and they vary by culture and they vary a little bit by practice artifactually but the structural phenomenology of the experience is almost universal for certain aspects. And uh, for example, I've written on near-death experiences um, among Native American populations. Mm. And uh, these were historical accounts. It took place over 400 years before there was a literature on near-death experiences, before anybody knew what they were. And from a lot of different uh, Native American tribes scattered over a huge geographic area, and yet the structure of the experience, regardless of how differently it's interpreted, mm -hmm. is essentially the same. And other researchers now have done a lot of cross-cultural examination of near-death experiences. And even though the cultural interpretation may be different, some people, instead of seeing uh, what Westerners typically describe as uh, Jesus or God as the being of light, they will experience a supreme being in that realm that they uh, may interpret as Yama, the Hindu god of the dead. Mm. But he, he, the dynamics are the same and what happens is the same. Uh, so there are a few things that are culturally conditioned, I just while well, I'm talking about NDEs for the moment, um, the tunnel phenomenon and the um, uh, life review tend to be Western. You do you find that much less often in Asian or Pacific Islander or, or other accounts, but all the rest of the things are. And that's true, I think, with transcendent sex. They are the same altered states phenomenologically that you see in a lot of spiritual traditions, whether it's Sartori, Enlightenment, Fana uh, you know, in uh, the Western and, and Asian traditions, or whether you're doing something like shamanic journeying, where you're going through different worlds um, and meeting different different kinds of entities or their past life experiences like the reincarnation traditions. Um, they are phenomenologically no different basically than the ones you reach in sp using spiritual practices. So I think it, it begs the question, you know, are these things wired into us? We think of them as spiritual because they have a they're different than our sensory experience of the material world, but they are things that are produced somehow through our bodies, however that happens. And I still don't think we have a good idea of how a lot of that happens. Yeah, it's interesting to note that, you know, your, your first path was like, oh, why are these people from different um, parts of the company conflicting? Not like on the same page and not being able to communicate with each other. And you're like, I need to understand that. And then, and then this path was like, oh, I had this really interesting, well, multiple different interesting experience. I need to explore it more deeply. Um, is that how you're kind of driven? It's like, I have, I just see the world or I have these experiences and like, I need to go understand this and how it works. Yeah, I wish I could say I, I were more uh, prescient or visionary, but yeah, it's almost like, you know, the cosmos has to hit me over the head with something. <laughs> like, oh, that might be interesting to look at. But yes, that, that's how I have come to 
almost all the areas of, of research that I've looked at. That's very cool. And how about like what's floating your boat these days in terms of your research and interests? Um, well, at the moment, I'm revisiting an area uh, previously of interest to me, and that's uh, pre and perinatal awareness. Um, I'm very interested in consciousness prior to birth. We know a lot about uh, consciousness, the other extreme of the lifespan uh, with near death experiences, but we don't know very much about consciousness prior to birth. And as you know, Michael, from my first book, um, consciousness prior to birth is very much like near death consciousness that there is an awareness of the body and the being in the body has normal or very limited sensory experience and cognition depending on the condition of the body at the time. But there's another source of consciousness that seems to be fully mature, non-attached to what is going on. Um, the popular way of thinking about it is witness conscious that is available at the same time. And it is not hooked by the trauma or sort of the ordinary events that are going forward. It rises above that. And it actually has, as with the near-death experiences, it has an out-of-body perspective on what's going on. And so uh, after looking at that at, at one point, um, I'm revisiting that now. Um, I've just been completing an analysis of what purport to be people's earliest memories that were submitted to various websites. Mm -hmm. And what I'm finding, and it surprised me because I, I was not aware of this literature outside of popular books. Um, what I was finding was that a lot of people were reporting otherworldly experiences, that they remembered being in some other realm, um, meeting some spiritual entities, uh, being able to make some choices about the life that they were about to have, typically choosing their body, uh, things about their body and like what sex they would be, and choosing the parents before suddenly being born into this life. And because at my earlier time of writing about this, those records had not been around. They're, they're new. I was not expecting to see this kind of data and I was pretty skeptical about it. Um, there was a regression therapist named Newton, Michael Newton, who found that his regression patients uh, would spontaneously bring up descriptions of life between lives mm -hmm. that had this whole otherworldly component to it. And although he was initially skeptical, he began to believe them and he developed a model of stages between lives that he uncovered doing uh, past life therapy, if you want to call it that. And um, his books were fairly influential when I looked at his protocols in the published transcripts, I thought they were pretty leading and I thought he was actually suggesting a lot of this to his clients. So I was pretty skeptical of these prenatal accounts. But what I found out is now from Ian Stevenson's very rigorous research into children who spontaneously remember past lives cross-culturally, he identified what he called an intermission phase between lives that had recollections of the past life and looking uh, at the body after the person was dead. It sounds very much like the beginning phase of an NDE where the person's awareness comes out of their body and they're looking at the body until the body is disposed of in these reincarnation accounts. And then sort of a period in between where Westerners report being in an otherworldly place. Asian people in this sample seem to be in a terrestrial location, like a pagoda near their house, or in a Bodhi tree, or something like that. And then they may see their parents and then presumably come into the next life. Well, a couple of other researchers using the same data 
had expanded that slightly. So what I think now I've been tapping into with these prenatal accounts from a completely different sample is this Western idea or of an otherworldly place or experience memory of an otherworldly place. And there are many myths cross-culturally that talk about exactly such a place where the dead and the unborn live before the unborn come to earth and the unborn may see something about their future life, but all of their memories are expunged when they are born. And that's exactly what some of the, this sample talked about was you know, the, how hard they tried to remember and how difficult it was. And sometimes they couldn't remember anything. And so, anyway, so that's, that's my uh, current project. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I'll ask you to keep me in the loop on that. I'm actually doing a cert in pre and perinatal psychology and health. Oh, great. Uh, so I'm studying as much of this space as possible. So I'd love to learn more about what you're, you know, what you learn as you learn it. That'd be very cool. Sure. I'd be happy to send you that. Thank you. So besides transcendence, yeah. um, where can people learn more about your work, your writing, your books, things along those lines? Yes. Um, well, and, and I, I know I talked to you about my battle trance um, uh, stuff. Um, I'm still publishing in, in that space as well. Uh, this is also, this is another one of those innate human capacities that um, other uh other animals have, and it's a defensive state uh, that can become an aggressive state um, when under attack. And uh, humans have the ability to um, go into a kind of group consciousness or individual consciousness that uh, frees them from fear promotes uh, their ability to keep on fighting with tremendous stamina and quickness, even when they are badly injured. Uh, to some extent, it will stop bleeding. And people are in this analgesic state where they have superhuman strength and endurance to do things. And you see the odd news article here or there where some uh, life-threatening situation brought this about, maybe... There was one uh, fairly recently where two teenage girls saw uh, a car roll over, I think it was on their father, and they managed to pick it up and get him out from under and rescue him. And an old man, a man in his 70s, overturned a tractor that had fallen on somebody that he saw. So these bursts of amazing strength and ability can happen. But it used to be a state that warriors knew how to cultivate uh, in ancient times when most combat was face to face and with bladed weapons. In the ancient world, it was already going out of fashion by the time of classical Greek, uh, Greece and Rome for massed fighting in, in large formations. But where you have single combat champions and the Norse tradition still had a lot of writing about this. Uh, the people that were known as berserks, Berserk, or berserker yeah. warriors. So there's a particular state called berserker gang that people got into in order to fight. And it enabled them to fight longer and harder and without serious, without succumbing to their injuries um, in a way that warriors who didn't know how to prepare did. And so this has been something that militaries have tried to cultivate, although these days, because the nature of warfare technology has changed so much, it's no longer as effective, but it is still a capacity that people have, and one that is cultivated in martial arts of all kinds and certain spiritual traditions. There are a lot of North African Islamic traditions in particular that where these states are considered a sign of spiritual attainment. And that's also true in certain Asian uh, traditions. And you find people, and this is freely available on the internet, who will stick swords, spears, umbrellas, neon lights through their cheeks, through their backs, 
uh, through different parts of their body with minimal, almost no bleeding and no pain in this natural trance state, no drugs that they've managed to achieve. And these items can be removed from their bodies and without bleeding and without infection. So it would be a tremendous capacity for us as humans to cultivate deliberately yeah. in healthcare situations. So uh, that's another that's just another part of anything. No, that's great because I was just thinking, God, a lot of my friends in the special operations community would be very interested in this, but I didn't think about healthcare. This yeah. is okay. Yeah, um, for, for all kinds of surgeries. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Well, I'm, I'll make sure to include as many links in the show notes as possible because uh, there's so many really interesting things that you're talking about. And uh, I would encourage you, if you'd be interested, to come back on in the future to continue this yeah, dialogue. Sure, I'd be, sure. Like, I'd be happy to. What you have in your mind is amazing. <laughs> More out of it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and your website? Um, or any place like how can people find? Um, I well, there is a transcendent sex website. If you just look up transcendent sex as one word dot org, um, there's information there about uh, about that research. And if you have your own story you'd like to contribute, there's a place where you can uh, provide your story. It's not published, but I do use it for ongoing research. Um, there is a very old website for my developmental work. Uh, and it's geared toward people in the business community. So I don't talk about the higher stages there. And that is called Wade, my last name, W-A-D-E, mindsets, all is one word, dot org. Because I don't talk about it as stages of consciousness when I'm in uh, corporate settings. I understand. <laughs> yeah, wademindsets.org. Yeah. So, so that is there. Um, these other things are just kind of, I guess, one-off projects that I'm interested in. So there's not a central place where you can find that, but um, I can certainly give you links to where I've published on Mr. these things. And That'd be great. So for sure. well, Jenny, great to see you. I appreciate your time. Let me encourage folks to do check out Transcendent Sex, as well as your other book and uh, articles and your work. It's, it's amazing. Great to see you again, and I appreciate your time. Thanks. Always a pleasure to talk to you, Michael.